I'm going to cover a few things. These are important for you to know. If somebody had told me these things when I was a young neuro sculptor of other human beings, I would have been a different parent and I certainly would have been a different teacher and probably a different human being. I'm going to zip through some things and then I'm going to lead you down the garden path to some other things. So, I always start with this quote, I wish I had made it, but I think I was the first to use this term. A guy named Dan Siegel did it, and you should read this uh, article. It basically says, look, during those first two decades, parents, you better know who you're handing your neurologic unit over to. You may call that person your child, I call them a neurologic unit, <laughs> because it does what we call set the end set point. Example, if I take, I use rubber bands as metaphors because I work with kids. If I take instrumental music, which I did before the age of 10, by the way, if I had a child now, he or she would be learning instrumental music because it uses many parts of the brain that are later used for very high level, levels of thinking. So I started clarinet and ends of neurons grow and that's what makes a brain literally bigger when you use it, it's a muscle. So as I took clarinet, it started to grow. The problem is I hated it and I wasn't good at it and I cried and my mother let me quit. We have since found out that instrumental music isn't one area of the brain, it uses many areas of the brain. My hair will be lovely by the end. It uses so many areas of the brain to learn how to play instrumental music. Many of those are used for problem solving, math and science later. So once I learned this, I went back to my mother, explained that instrumental music was hard for me, an indication that that part of my brain needed to grow. When something is hard for you, it means that part of the muscle wasn't as big as it needs to be. And had I kept going enough, at least a couple of years, what it does is it sets the end point. I could have stretched those parts of my brain that dealt with instrumental music this much, but I didn't. I only did it six months. The brain in the second decade of life is designed to prune and streamline. And anything I gave up for a long period of time in the second decade, the brain goes, guess that's not important, and it actually shrivels because there's a streamlining that happens the second decade. So I go to my mother and I say, Mom, do you know what I could have been? <laughs> <laughs> and you let me quit. How could you? And she said, but honey, you cried. I said, so what? You're my mother. <laughs> it's one message I want to give to you. Parents who coddle their children, parents who wrap them in cotton wool, whatever words you use, too much, are having just the opposite effect you think you're having. I know you don't want your children to hurt. I know you don't want your children to struggle. This is a muscle. If you stop using parts, if your parents do it for you, or pull you away from somebody who might bite you, that you might learn from how to handle people who bite. If that happens too much, the parts actually shrivel. So I want you to read this. Isn't that neat? This is a journal called Scientific American Mind. Five years ago, they had to publish a three-page article in their journal of all the confirmed differences in the brain by sex. This is May, June, 2010 they had to publish a special thick edition with all the confirmed differences in the brain by sex. If you don't believe me, I've got another one to prove it to you. Read this. I talked to your daughters about the fact that the female brain is different from the male brain in many areas. These are now well documented. If you want the truth, read a book like this. She takes research from many areas and puts it together. We're worried about a couple of these. The ACC is the anterior cingulate cortex. It's actually born bigger in a girl brain than a boy brain. So girls and boys have some differences. They're not good or bad, they're just is's. Let me give the example. In general, 80% of girls can read the faces of people better than 80% of boys. Do you believe me? It's true. 
And even those 80% of boys that are decently good at it, they're usually only decently good unless they've been trained in <coughs> reading faces of people they know. 80% of girls are good at reading even stranger faces. I'm up here reading your faces. I'm a master. Don't you be thinking some of those things you're thinking. <laughs> Unless we work with boys. Boys who go to school with girls learn social skills faster than boys who go to a boys' school. The research says if you have a girl, she will learn better social skills. She will develop more leadership skills, more resilience and chutzpah and self-esteem if she spends a good deal of time in an all-girl setting. The research says for a boy, the same things will happen if he spends a good deal of time in a co-ed setting. Isn't that a kick? <laughs> when you're born, you're just a gob of, I don't know, apples or cherries or whatever strudel has in the center. But you're not anything until the layers start to form around you. And you don't become a sturdy strudel until you have like 10, 20, or 30 layers of that fine phyllo dough. So you're born with some goo. You've got this gooey mess when you're born, and then you become a person by layering this. That's why I want your girls to es experience conflict in a place of semi-sanctuary. This school is one of the, when Carrie and Karen asked me to come here, I had closed February. I now have enough work, I can say no to people, especially if it's in Toronto in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> but when they said, would you come to Branksome Hall again, that part opened up and I stuffed you in. You know I'm getting on a red eye again tomorrow and was on a red eye yesterday to get here. That's how powerful this school is. It's one of the few girls' schools in this country that understands that some conflict is what creates a sturdy, resilient human being. And they don't try to control everything. They control the things that are pervasive. That's what you want. If somebody is continually harming your child, but the few things that happen here and there, if they controlled them and there was no social conflict and your girls didn't come home and cry and go, oh, mom, oh, dad, I would tell you, get your daughter out of that school. And the kind of programs a school like this has, you should look in their handbook of what they do when they have something like bullying or they have forms that you can fill out and send off to somebody so that there's somebody there that can help you talk through that. You will never find that kind of thing in other schools. And the last thing I'm going to say, when researchers look at girls and boys who developed resilience over time, who weren't born with what we call natural resilience, who actually grew in it over time. They tried to look at their lives and see what it was that did it. And there's probably many things, and some we know. But the only variable they could pull out, the only variable that was a theme across the board, quantity of time spent with family, go home. Thank you.